Welcome to the uh, almost last session for, for this day. It's a um, free and open source software. Uh, and I have uh, today a great honor to sit, uh, sit here with, uh, with our guest. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, Matthias Kirchner. The second uh, is Stefano Zakiroli and uh, Simon Phipps. And uh, so now uh, each of you uh, can tell about yourself uh, for about 10 minutes and about your main topics. And after we will go to discussion and then the questions from, from public. Okay, my name is uh, Matthias Kirschner. I'm employed by the Free Software Foundation Europe. And here in my hand, I have more computing power than the whole world together when we landed on the moon. Or when someone made a really cool picture which looked like someone landed on the moon. So nowadays, these machines, these computers, aren't just in space stations, rockets, but they are everywhere. They are in phones, they are in tablets, routers, washing machines, freezers, uh, robots, uh, they, they, um, you name it, in cars, airport, uh, airplanes. And the majority of those devices also runs free software on them. So with this machine, we have a huge potential to enhance, enhance uh, other machines. We have a potential with these universal computers to solve a lot of problems on this earth and to develop things which all together here we cannot imagine yet what will happen in the next years. So to use this potential, we need universal computers and we need free software to self-determine use those machines. We need software which allows us to use the software for any purpose, to do with it what we please to do and not what someone else tells us to do. We need to be able to study how this software works, to understand how this machine works. For this, it's necessary that we get the source code of the software. We need to be able to share the software with others. So when I solve the problem on my machine, I, and I see someone else uh, also has a problem on his machine, I can give them uh, the software and they have one problem less. And we have to be able to adopt the software to our own needs. So we have to be able to change the software so the machines do what we want them to do and not to change our behavior because we cannot do it in another way. So the free software movement fought exactly for those for freedoms to use, study, share, and improve software for over 30 years now. And all our licenses, they, um, they grant those for freedoms. But now there are uh, developments to restrict us and to take away those freedom again from us. So it's, um, they're destroying this powerful machine which we have. They are making this by first making the software non-free. They take away all these four freedoms. They tell us for what exactly we are allowed to use this software and for what we are not allowed to use this software. They tell us you are not allowed to learn what these machines actually do, what these computers do, what the software does on them, by not offering us the source code. They don't allow us to share the software with others and say, no, it's just for you. Uh, we solve your problem, but if you have something on your machine, you are not allowed to give this to, to others. And, um, and they don't allow us to actually change the software so we can live our lives in the way we want. Second, they are locking down devices. They are locking down these machines, so we are not able to install free software on them or install any other software on the devices. And um, third, they are taking away important tasks, important software from those machines to somewhere else and thereby also our di data to somewhere else into the rainy clouds. And yeah, with this, they take away freedoms which we had before or with which we have when we are using free software. So we have to counterbalance this. We have to 
we have to make sure that we balance the powers between those who create software and those who then receive the software but also would like to, to change it again or ask someone else to, to change it. And we have to make sure that we can, we can control those computers and that others cannot control us with these computers. So we have to resist to these restrictions which they oppose on us, and that's important for, for our democracy in the 21st century, so that we are able to control computers and not the computers controlling us. So, I hand over to you. Okay. Okay, so now Stefano Zakiroli from Debian Project. Yeah, so I, indeed I'd like to start from uh, where Matthias left. So in, uh, in the 80s, in the, the end of the 80s, when we started with the idea of free software, the main point was actually giving freedom to the few people respect, with respect to the day that back then were using computers. So th the point of freedom is mainly a point about controlling your own machines. So everywhere you have software which runs on something, if you are able to look at what this software is doing, you are able to know what is happening to your digital life. And this is becoming more and more important these days because we have software everywhere. So software is not only in what we use to call computers at the desk. Software is everywhere. It's in our car, it's in our fridges, in the, in the oven if it is connected to the internet. So we are giving up much, we are giving up more and more of our uh, life to software and we need to be in control of that software. Otherwise, we are not in control of our own life. So it's becoming more and more important, and historically, the way we have been giving, we in the free software world, we have been giving free software to people has been via what we call distributions. So distributions are actually collection of free software pieces, free software components that people like me collect together and make it easy to use for people. So speaking of myself, I've been leading Debian, which is a project which is set in 1993 to create a, a, the best possible free, entirely free operating system, and Debian is one of these distributions. So um, today, is, Debian is something which is pretty influential as most free software, so you have it in like uh, the, the vast, the, about uh, one web server over 10 you visit during a, an average day is something which is run by Debian. You have Debian on the, on the International Space Station. So you have Debian in a lot of devices from the very small to the very big, and that's the case also for a lot of other free software parts. So that's pretty good because it means that we are making a dent. So in the industry, in the, uh, in the IT sector, a lot of people are using free software. And that's pretty good. It's something that for me was probably not really imaginable 20 years ago. Um, what's, what's troubling me, and this topic which I'd like to discuss with you today, is that we are kind of in a weird situation. So we are in a situation in which we are reaching out to people, we are giving free software to people. If you think that Android, for instance, is the, is the lead uh, operating system in mobile phones, that means they are giving a part, a stack based on free software to a lot of people. And that's very good. And you are also increasing the kind of penetration of free software in the desktop market and in laptop. It's, it's going pretty well. But on the other hand, people are moving their computation more and more away from their devices. So we have a lot of people with free software-based phones. We have a lot of people with free software-based desktop or laptops, which are doing a lot of their computations not on their computers. So they're doing a lot of those computations in what we call the cloud, on uh, uh, infrastructure pieces like uh, uh, Google Apps or, or this kind of, uh, of software stacks. And that means that they're using their devices only as really dumb devices in which they do some very basic stuff like entering data and pushing those data to other people, okay, which run software that we do not know what is doing on their data and get back the results. Okay, so in a sense, we are outsourcing our computation from our own devices to other people. So it's kind of a paradox because in some sense, we are, we are close to winning the market and having free software in the hands of many people, but at the same time, we are moving, we are moving away, we are pushing away further the digital freedom that those people need to really know what's happening with their, with their data. So this is what I call from, uh, which I used to call the, the dark ages of free software, so it's something which scares me a little bit, and it's something we should fight back. So to fight back on that, we need actually help from many different actors, we need help from free software hackers, people who are writing free software. We need those people to realize that we need 
some replacements, a good replacement for centralized, well, for centralized applications like social networks or, or uh, office suites which run in the cloud. And all these kind of software stacks, we need replacement of them which are federated. We need replacement of them that people can run on their own computer communicating with other computers. And this is something for free software hackers, people writing free software for a living. We need help from people who are, doing the, who are creating the distributions. So we need help to make those applications really easy to use for the average person, which is not necessarily an expert in IT. We need my grandparents to be able to buy a very cheap computer, connect it to the internet, their home, their house, and run on it a part of a social network which will communicate with me without being, you know, passing through Google or Facebook or any other uh, big giant like those. And finally, we need help from the policymakers. So we need some kind of policy rules which actually encourages or forces big companies that are running centralized services to, to actually empower their users. For instance, we cannot certainly force uh, big actors to uh, use only free software, but we can force them to give to users the ability to take away their data when they want to move. This is a kind of a very effective policy we can require to be able to enable people to migrate from centralized infrastructure to other centralized infrastructure, or better, to migrate to federated infrastructure the day we have it. And, and finally, we, on the same line of thought, but there can be a lot, many more examples, we can, for instance, have policies to ensure that public administration do not rely on centralized services they do not control, but if they really need something which is like a cloud, that they run their own cloud, possibly federating with other public administration. And the list is long. We can go on a lot with the set of public policies we need to help having people that, are, uh, that control their own data, and we need to work in that direction. Thank you, and Simon. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Simon Phipps. I'm the president of the Open Source Initiative. Uh, we define which licenses count as open source and practically implement the ideas of free software for businesses. Over the last uh, 15 years, I'd like to suggest to you that in the corporate space, free and open source software has won the argument. Pretty much everything you use today on the internet relies on free and open source software. But I'd like to bring you a, a, a larger proposition, starting from where uh, Zach left off. I'd like to suggest to you that a free society now requires free and open source software to guarantee its liberty. That a society which is based on proprietary software cannot be a free society. To explain what I mean by that, first of all, I'd like to suggest to you that the whole premise on which the Pirate Party is based is a changed society. The industrial society was based around the monetization of scarcity, scarcity of resource, scarcity of manufacture, of distribution, of finance. And the law that was built in that society involved arbitrating control of those scarcities and regulating the markets in which that control was expressed. The regulation of those markets resulted in hierarchies of control points, with arbitration between the control points determining who would be profitable, determining who would be elected, determining who would be published. But today we have a new society that has emerged because the World Wide Web is running on the internet. That emerging culture is a meshed society. It is a network of peers. Each citizen has variable roles rather than the fixed roles they had in the hierarchical industrial society. They have the potential of relationships with anyone across the mesh. They have the potential to play any role, be it creator, be it user, be it modifier, be it financer. But the law that is being applied to this meshed society is still the law that came from the industrial era. It is still the law about arbitrating scarce control points. And the winners of the last century are using that law to try to snuff out the freedom of the individuals living in the meshed society. Now, Lawrence Lessig explained uh, in one of his great books how 
the emerging mesh society is one where code is law, where it doesn't matter what it says on the statute books, what matters is what actually gets experienced by the citizen. So it doesn't much matter whether you have a right to privacy if the NSA can tap your network. It doesn't much matter whether you have a right to free speech if the Prime Minister of Turkey can turn off your network. Code is law. And if we want to have a free society, we need to have free code. Proprietary code is code you can't look in. It's code you can't understand how it's implementing the law. It's code that can take away your rights without you knowing about it. And I'd suggest, therefore, that all public software works should be open source, free software. I'd suggest to you that any proprietary software that's used by your government, whether it be for uh, communicating with citizens, it's their word processor, whether it be the code that runs the tax system, whether it be the software used to survey society by the police, whatever it is, if that law is, if that, co that code is proprietary code, then your law has been outsourced to their suppliers, to a place where you can't investigate it, to a place where you can't understand it, and to a place where you can't check that your rights are still in place. So while Matthias has talked about the, the individual imperative of the, direct, uh, of the uh, developer to maintain software freedom, the freedom to use, to study, to improve, and to share software, and while Zach has talked about the imperative to make sure that computing remains under the control of the citizen rather than under the control of an unseen cloud provider, I suggest that this needs to be bound together by a priority in politics to keep the code that implements the law open and free for all to see. Thank you very much. And I think we can all agree that we have a battle to win, a battle between a free world and a world owned by, comp uh, by uh, corporations and governments. The war between the free society and society owned by other corporations. And as, uh, as you all told, uh, we, uh, the only way uh, to win this battle is to use the free and open source uh, software. Uh, do you have any idea how we can use it? Because as a pirates, we are all also a developers, but developers of, of ideas and uh, developers of a uh, new way of political thinking and political systems. Uh, maybe there is a way to use your experience in, in our job. So I guess this is mostly in the in direction of how do you manage communities of people that are doing stuff together? And I think from in the, on that direction, you have there is a lot of experience in the free and open source software world that you can learn from. So a first point I think I want to make is try to set an example. So we have been doing like a free software and open source for 20 years, I guess, at this table, and maybe maybe more. And uh, it's it was very hard in the beginning to actually use what you were preaching to others. So try to be exemplar in the what you're proposing to people and try to use what you're proposing for them to use. So if you want to promote free, free software to, to people, to public administration, try to show, show off the usage of free software. So try to, make, to go to people, learn how to use free utilities and, mo and show the people that they're usable and that they can overcome some of the dif initial difficulties you have every time you migrate from something you know to something you don't know and so on and so forth. Try to be credible on this front. And on the other hand, on the end of how do you manage your, your, your communities, so what we've been doing, I guess most communities in free software have been doing that, is to actually have some mechanism of working together which are really empowering of the individuals in the following sense. So we do not really have structure which are really, really uh, democratic in free software in the sense that you don't see a lot of voting. And I'm seeing that as a member of a community, which is Debian, which is often uh, mentioned for one of the most political and bureaucratic and one of the, the, the uh, organization which uses votes the most in free software. But still, it's very empowering of the ability of individuals. So try to 
create collaboration rules in which everyone, someone can contribute something and create something, a piece of software, or changing something which is not working well, well, she can do that. And try to resort to collective decision making only when it's for some fundamental role, only when it's from something which is deeply related to the ethos of what we're trying to build. But in everything else, try to enable individuals to contribute something and to change their small part of, the, of your political ideas and your political activities that can directly change without having to, to decide together and go through some bureaucratic process and so on and so forth. This is, I think, one, something that you can learn from in from free software. I think there is one, one other thing you can learn. That's uh, at the beginning of the free software movement. Like, uh, there was one man, Richard Stallman, in 1983. And he didn't accept that software which was given to him, that he didn't receive the source code anymore. And he said, it's important to have these four freedoms, and I will start to write a complete operating system where each piece gives us those four freedoms to use, study, share, and improve the software. And at that time, people laughed at him, people said that's impossible, but he started doing it. He started to write the code, and other people joined him. And they joined him, and they worked on that, and now see what happened, what, what's the case now. The majority of computers is running free software now. So that's one thing you can learn. And another thing which you can also learn is, like, even if in your, in your group, in your movement, there are difficulties and you disagree, and uh, sometimes the discussions in the, in the pirate party, they remind me of discussions we have or had in the, in the free software movement where it's, it's also like uh, the criticism is raised in an unusual manner for the public. Um, you, what you can learn out of that is that uh, you can still get something done. And uh, yeah, I think we, we achieved it and you might also achieve that. Um, I'd like to suggest a couple of things to you. The first thing I'd say to you is that um, we have not arrived in the new world yet. And uh, if we're going to have code that is our proxy law be open, we have to change the way that that code gets purchased by our public administrations. So one of the important places to go fix things is in the procurement rules that have cozy relationships with incumbent supplier, suppliers inherited from the 20th century world of floppy disks. And uh, of, I'm talking eight inch floppy disks here as well. Uh, cozy relationships with suppliers from those days. Um, the place to go challenge those things, I suggest to you, is data formats and APIs. That's to say the places where uh, citizens interact with government. Those are the places where proprietary software does the most harm. So, for example, uh, in some countries, it's impossible to use an open source web browser to engage with the government because the government's suppliers have insisted on using Microsoft Internet Explorer and have insisted on using proprietary plugins to the browser that mean you can't actually apply for university from a piece of software that is free software. You must go out and buy software. That's a tax on, on democracy. Uh, it requires people to be rich enough to go buy proprietary software, even if they're willing to actually let proprietary software in their home. Or violate the law. Or, or, or break the law. Um, uh, the, the, the other uh, aspect is exit costs. The cost of using proprietary software is actually very high because um, vendors who sell things to government make them very inexpensive to acquire, but very expensive to own. Uh, and proprietary lock-in uh, puts all of the cost of the transaction at uh, later down the life cycle. Uh, for example, the cost of exiting the use of a software is uh, often very high because of proprietary activities. So if you want to fix procurement, make sure that people who are buying software have to tell you what it will cost to stop using it as well as what it will cost to start using it. In other words, in make sure exit costs are included in estimates. Those are all three very practical things that you can do, but uh, those are to, first of all, attack file formats, and secondly, to uh, make sure that exit costs are declared. If you do that, you'll be able to get free software into public administrations where it's been very hard to get it before. 
No, okay, thank you. And you mentioned uh, at the beginning about um, keeping the balance between software creators and software users. What, uh, in your opinion, would be the best way to do it? Uh, do we have to start from the grassroots, so from educating people, for example, in uh, primary schools and all the users of our software, or, it's, uh, or is it a better way to start from uh, legislation? So, I mean, what I meant with balancing the power between uh, people who created software and people who are using it is that, I mean, this difference, user and uh, developer in free software, it doesn't exist. There is, is, it's not a, a clear cut between those. And um, when you receive software and you are using it, at one point, the, you might be unhappy with the software, uh, and either you might go to someone else and ask them to change something for you, or if nobody's willing to do this, or if it will cost you too much, you might become a developer yourself and change it so you can do something in the way you want to do it and not change like the creator of the software thought and uh, accept all his values and uh, all the, the premises uh, the other person made when writing these laws for you. So. Of course, I mean, we, what we have to do in, in, in order to, um, that everybody can participate in this is that people understand how software works and that they can write software and that in, in, in schools they don't just learn how to uh, make uh, a presentation where things fly in and uh, do all kind of uh, strange things, but that they really understand how are these computers, how are these machines what, what makes them, how do they work, so that they learn programming. Because the programming, it will be, in, in a few uh, years, it's, uh, programming will be like reading and writing. And we have to make sure that, that everybody can read and write, and that it's not like in, in the uh, several hundred years ago where people were not allowed to, to learn how to read and write. So we, we have to make sure that everybody who wants to do this can do this and participate at the lawmaking process. And, of course, on the other side, we also need legislation that people are allowed to do this. That people have the freedom to, to participate in this process and that they are not forbidden to, to take part in, in writing uh, laws for, um, for our society. So when someone says you are not allowed to, to, um, to uh, understand how a software works or uh, you are not allowed to change software, that should be something which should not be allowed by law. So I think we've come to a terrible place in the world where we are at the moment, where we think that it should be forbidden to take apart things that are digital. We discourage our kids from uh, watching movies they haven't paid for, from breaking them apart and making new movies. We discourage all the tools that they might do that with, all in the name of protecting Mickey Mouse from falling into the public domain. And the price that we as a society are paying for all of those restrictions is a generation of people who don't have the instinct to take things apart to find out how they work. I, I used to do, I'm pretty old as you can see, I used to do that all the time. I used to take things apart to find out how they worked. Sometimes I could even put them back together again afterwards. Uh, we need to encourage the emerging generations to take things apart and find out how they work and when that comes to most things people have today, that means the software and not just the box. We've got to encourage people to want to take things apart, reward them for doing so, and teach them how to do it right when they realize they did it wrong. And I think that's the key to bringing uh, uh, software freedom into the heart of culture. Yeah, I want to elaborate, expand a bit on that. So I'm also a teacher. In, I'm teaching computer science at the university for, for a living. And I think there are two separate deb debates here. One is the 
uh, resistant to migrate to free software. And this is mostly because I think we have a generation of workers that are using IT in their daily job, even if their job is not in IT, they're just using computers as devices to do any other kind of work, and they've been teaching to use that computer in a very visual way. So they've been, they've been, they've been teaching like, there is an icon which is like that, and when you click on that icon, something happens. So if you have this kind of very uh, limited teaching of what's happening, very rudimentary teaching of how to use a computer, then it's very difficult to migrate to anything. So it's not really a matter of how difficult it is to migrate from uh, proprietary software like Windows to free software. It's really a matter of it's very difficult for those people to migrate from any technology to another technology. I think this specific problem will just go away with time because we are getting into a generation of people which have been using computers since they were quite young and they're starting to get the, the basic notions of computers and not learning visually how to use a technology. The second point is that we need to teach people the fundamental things in the use of computers which are not related to technology. So the point is not teaching people to use specific piece of free software. I don't think the goal is having schools that teach how to use LibreOffice. Of course, for me, it would be much better to teach to use LibreOffice than to use Microsoft Office, but that's not the point. The point is to teach people starting from when they are very young, the basic notion of computer science, which are independent from specific technology, the notion of information, the notion with, that when you enter some information in a computer, it will be stored somewhere. And that somewhere could be that computer itself, or it could be a server far, far away owned by someone else. If you teach to students these basic notions, they will start to have a critical thinking about technology and will start to be able to understand the difference between source code and binary code, the difference between having data that they control and having data they do not control and so on and so forth. And there are great examples of this. For instance, I'm living in France currently, and they've given the option to every student of age, I think, 15 and 16, to ask to have a specific formation in computer science, and it's really a formation in computer science, not the usages from specific office suite. They teach the basics of algorithms, of, in, of uh, information, storage, and so on and so forth. That's the only thing that in the medium term and will, can change the way people ap approach technology. Thank you. And last question from me is about uh, uh, the things that, that Simon mentioned about the Turkey, because that's the political things, a kind of political things and a bad way of doing politics. Uh, so uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge in front of Pirate Party connected to the free and open source, especially the free software, and how we can bring it to the people? within the next two or three years? Mm. The short perspective. The like short the answer, okay. Um, I, I think there are some, some interesting challenges facing Europe uh, that need the Pirate Party to embrace them and that need free software to implement them. Um, I think what's what's going on. So, so I'm, I'm just to talk about Turkey briefly. I think we're the Turkish people are very lucky that the Turkish government is not competent enough to block the internet as effectively as the British government can. Uh, I'm sure that Mr. Erdogan's uh, answering machine has got a little flashing light from an American company telling him how he should have blocked the so the internet better using their proprietary software. And I'm sure that next time he does it, it will work. They won't just be able to change the DNS because of deep packet inspection will let, the, let that be defeated. The, the challenge is that uh, all of these governments treat um, the internet as something that is full of consumers. And the biggest challenge I think we face uh, with many of these cultural issues is that policymakers regard the internet as a hierarchy, just like in the Industrial Revolution. They believe it's just like a different kind of TV with people who make content and consumers who turn it on and off. They believe that there are no consequences of turning it off, just like there are no consequences of turning off the TV. They believe that uh, the only people who abuse the, uh, the internet are uh, people who are bad people, and therefore any measure that prevents bad people is only going to harm the bad people. And I think the fundamental challenge that the Pirate Party has got is to help people realize that in the meshed society there are no consumers, or if you prefer, in the meshed society we are all consumers and we are all creators, 
and we are all modifiers, we are all, we're all makers. And I think that is the fundamental challenge that the Pirate Party has got to, to deal with. The, the free software is simply the natural artifact of solving those problems. Because you can't have a society in which everybody is a consumer and a maker and a funder and a modifier if you're tr using proprietary software. The, the software simply won't permit it. So I think that's the big challenge. You've got to embrace this fact that the internet is a peer society not a hierarchical society, because all of the disgusting behavior that so-called leaders get up to, trying to block, filter, or ban the internet, all arises from the fact that they think it's possible, because they have this broken model that the internet is just a big TV. And we have to fix that understanding and help people realize the internet is not just a big TV. It's actually the fabric by which citizens engage each other as equals and as peers, and when you mess with it, you mess with the fabric of democracy. One short addition for, for the short term now. Um, I agree with everything what uh, Simon said here, but in the next uh, months and, uh, yeah, Definitely in the next month, there will be a lot of public funding available because of all the NSA scandals. And um, when software is developed with public funding, with public money, it has to be free software. So you have to look at all those uh, development, uh, all these fundings, and have to um, persist that this needs to be free software because if you accept non free software in the short term now, you will not reach your goals in long term. Okay, thank you very much. For, oh. yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to comment on how proper technology and public funding we can put in proper technology can actually help with situations like uh, Turkey or all other kind of censorship you have around the world. So there are a lot of technologies you're probably familiar with, like Tor or uh, a lot of similar stuff that can help you evade censorship, and you're probably already familiar with it. But the point is that it's not in the hand of people. So we are building a lot of this technology which is geek only, essentially. And the big challenge for us is actually enable users which are if you want computer illiterate to actually use that out of the box. So the, the optic you mentioned of using, you know, of seeing internet as a consumer thing is very right, and you presented the bad aspect of it, but what you are lacking is actually a product which is easy to use for random people, which is really a product in which you have a button, you turn it on, you turn it off, but when you turn it on, well, you have a mesh network between your home your mother's home, your parent, your girlfriend. And you know what, if they do deep packet inspection, too bad, you just have encrypted VPN toward another machine which is in France and they let you escape censorship jumping to it. We do not have this kind of technology. If we have it, it's just too hard to use for random people. And developing this kind of technologies is proving very hard for free software people because we, are, we have been working on that for many, many years and we do not have it yet. So maybe it's time to say this is a, a big important goal for Europe, for society as a whole. It's an important political goal. So let's put some public money on it to make it real. Thank you very much and now time for questions. Okay, so we can start from Bishop Łukasiak from the Polish Pirate Party. And I, I would like to ask you what is, in your opinion, the biggest obstacle now for open source and free software? Well, yeah. So from, for one thing, we are still fighting the battle we've been fighting for a very long while. So we were against uh, de facto monopolies, which we have, in which we are, you are, you, are, you have a lot of, you know, uh, interest from specific big corporations, and they are doing all they can to push on public procurement, to push on these kind of activities, to maintain those monopolies. So something we badly need, and we have always needed, and we still need, is decent laws on public procurement that say, you know what, accepting and using non-free software is bad for society. 
is not bad for individuals, it's bad for society as a whole, because you are giving your stuff in the hand of people you do not know. Okay, so we need to, 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 to fight those battles. I've been myself involved in some changes in Italian procurement law, in which we have now said that, you know what, by default, you only bind the public administration free software. You need to have very good reason to buy non-free software. You had to set technical criteria, and all other things being equal, you choose free software. And we are far, far, more, far away from having this being, you know, the default in all countries uh, all, all, all around Europe. So it's not like we have won, actually. We, we've actually managed to, to convince a lot of people that free software is good, but things we've been doing for a very long while at the political level, we still need to be doing them because we, we're not done yet. Um, I read an article about this in InfoWorld last week. Um, I don't think there are any barriers left to open source software. Open source software is in all your devices. It is running all of them. They are all dependent on it. Even Microsoft's software is dependent on it. Um, the problem now is that people are using that freedom to take away your freedom. And we're now beginning to see free software used to build systems that remove your liberty as a consumer or as a citizen. And I think the biggest challenge we have is forgetting that the objective was freedom, that the objective wasn't open source or free software. Uh, we've, we, we've won with open source and free software. It's everywhere. We, but we still don't have a world in which it's impossible for a vendor like Apple to take away your ability to consume the culture that you have paid for. Uh, they, they, it's all free software that they're using to implement it. Uh, they, the iTunes store is built on top of Linux. Uh, the software that they're using is all built from Apache components. It's all built uh, using uh, package management that's come from free software communities. But still, Apple can arbitrarily remove your access to a book or prevent you from watching a movie. And that's happened not because we've had a lack of focus on open, open source and free software. We've done really well. But we've forgotten that the objective was liberty. And that's what we need to do is to focus back on liberty as the objective. For me, it's the same thing. It's the understanding that this is about freedom, that, th that we are doing this because of this reason, not because this software might be a little bit better in some uh, cases or it might be cheaper in some cases. And the important consequence to invest in this freedom and to actually also, as an individual, to invest money in this not just say, okay, I'll pay for non-free software, but when someone actually gives me freedom, I'm not willing to pay. Just like to interject a little bit with Simon, because you know, it's for little polemics that we do panels, right? Absolutely. So, <laughs> no, I just, want to, I just want to make people aware of a little trap we often have, is that when we, we see something that it says a little note built on free software, that doesn't mean that it's 100% free software. And if you're relying, even if only 1% of the lines of code which are not free software, well, you're pretty much screwed. Because you don't know what the, those 1% 1 1 line of codes are doing with your data. Okay, so it's true, we are, free software is everywhere, but it's not like every software product is 100% free software. So we, I think we still have a lot of way to go, even mm -hmm. though so we have proven that you cannot build stuff without free software. With that, I very much agree. I think we have not proven that you can build everything 100% free software. What I observe is that free software is still lacking in the user interface area. Like, well, there are sure very good tools, but the average is much worse than, than commercial software. If I could just pick you up on that, uh, free software is commercial software because the four freedoms guarantee your ability to sell it to people if you wish. You, what you mean is proprietary software. Let me just channel Richard Stallman here. And at the same time, to, to, to agree and disagree with you at the same time. So I could argue that most, the, the market of mobile phones, for instance, is based on free software and it's good enough in terms of user interface to be the market lead, okay? I don't know if it's good or better or worse than uh, an iPhone in terms of UI, but it's good enough to be the market lead. On the other hand, which is my previous point, it's definitely not 100% free software. 
Okay, so we still have way to go in there as well. But I agree. And the answer is to buy free software from vendors who sell and support free software. Uh, so if instead of just using LibreOffice uh, at your office, you buy a support contract from Collabora, Collabora will be funded to do more work on that user interface. See, that we, we, we're deceived by the word free into thinking we, that we don't need to pay. And uh, when you uh, use free software, you should always ask yourself, who should I be paying? Not because I must, but because I can and because I should. And when you pay for your free software, the people you pay make it better. So if it's not good enough, that's because you're not paying or because you're not fixing it, one or the other. Uh, either fix it or pay, but please don't complain about it. Okay, next question. Uh, Stephen from the Romanian Pirate Party. Uh, one short question I have. How can we facilitate the growth of uh, open hardware, since hardware isn't open yet? So I, I'm not a major expert in open hardware, but I think that's a very different uh, battle in the sense that the kind of uh, business model you have around those is very different. So you can reasonably make money and have good business model around free software without having to scale from day one to very large amount of, uh, of pieces you need to sell. So, I'm, so it's not my field. I do not have an answer for your question, but I think a lot of the ideas we have and a lot of the experience we have grown with free software do not necessarily apply there. Um, so I run my telephone system at my office on a Raspberry Pi. Um, which, is uh, uh, which is which is almost all open hardware apart from a binary blob that Qualc <laughs> that uh, that still hasn't been documented from um, uh, from Qualcomm. Um, uh, I'd suggest to you that the, the 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 very best way to make people use open hardware is to document your experience, uh, because open hardware with, with with open source software I can get on IRC and I can ask someone how to do something. I, and in other words, I can tap into the community remotely. With open hardware, when it goes, when, when I reach an obstacle, I can't work out which pin to put something on, or I can't work out why I keep on making the Raspberry Pi blow up and there's smoke in the room. Uh, the only way to find the answer is to get somebody to show me. And I, they, the, the answer to these questions are typically not just one line that you cut and paste into IRC. They're typically case studies. So the best way to make open hardware grow is to document your use of open hardware, and then other people will A, be encouraged, and B, will copy what you did and make it better next time. There is, also for the open hardware, I'm not an expert, but there is, uh, there is one other part in it. That's uh, when, at the moment, more and more hardware is more and more restricted than we are used to in the past already then people will be used and accept that this uh, hardware is so restricted. I mean, when, when you buy a, a game uh, console nowadays, it's so completely locked up. But what's happening at the moment with, um, with Secure Boot um, on, the, on platforms uh, like our normal PCs, our, uh, our laptops, there's development which is locking up those devices. So, one other thing to, to support going into this direction of opening up the hardware is to first preserve what we, what we are used to have, that we can install free software on, uh, on our computers, and not that someone else can decide if we are allowed to install another uh, piece of software on the, on the devices. Do we have more questions? Okay, so I, I've, I've got my own theory about this user interface, going back to this subject, because it's something that I have thought about a lot. So a lot of free software is about scratching your own itch. So just fixing a bug or something and doing, and programmers can mostly do it on their own. While if you are a user interface uh, professional, or I don't know, artist, then what you do is it doesn't, it doesn't work alone. You need to have cooperation from programmers. So, so th that's why artists cannot go 
as far as programmers can go with free software. Just, just a theory of mine. <laughs> Um, so there, there is some uh, free software with good user interfaces. Um, Firefox, for example, has a great user interface. And that piece of magic is achieved by the Mozilla Foundation having started a private company called the Mozilla Corporation and employing a four-figure number of people to work in an organized way on Firefox, uh, analogous with the way that proprietary software corporations work. Um, the difficulty with software, with, so, so there's a lot of great software that works on servers. And um, you sit next to Zach, you see he's, he lives in a terminal on his machine here, and he's using all of that great software. Um, people who make changes to that software, there is no reason why they shouldn't share their changes with everybody else. It's in their interests to share changes with everyone else. And I'll explain why. As a software developer, if you invent something, you're responsible for keeping it working for the rest of eternity. Uh, now, if as a developer you invent something and you donate it to a community, you're now no longer responsible for keeping it working. Now, everyone in the community is responsible for keeping it working, and it's no longer your problem. Uh, you do that because it is much more in your interests to share your improvements with everybody than it is in your interests to keep them secret. You can keep them secret. If they're huge, maybe you can sell them. But really, there isn't a lot of money to be made from fixing bugs and implementing features in free software. There's much more money to be had from being a consultant who's deploying it. Now, when it comes to software with user interfaces, that dynamic doesn't apply. Uh, making a piece of software have a brilliant user interface, well, Honestly, it doesn't really save you a lot of work from giving it to the community because probably anyone who changes it is going to make it worse. Uh, probably the reason you did it was because a client commissioned it from you and owns the copyright. And many of the things that make software with user interfaces get better are a different dynamic. So to have better software with good user interfaces, we need to look at different community dynamics. We need to ask ourselves, how can we repeat uh, Mozilla's experience and create communities that are paid to work on free software. Uh, how can we, at LibreOffice, for example, how can we make LibreOffice have new user interface elements without selling out control of the community to a corporation? These are, these are quite difficult questions to answer. But I think we know that we have these problems, and so those two, I'm familiar with those two projects. Um, there are other projects with user interfaces who are addressing these challenges. But that's the long answer that has the same as my, my, my snarky answer to you last time is still the same answer. It is the software with user interfaces only gets better if you pay for the free software you depend on. Because the people you pay are the people who will make it better. I'll add two more examples to the list of free software user interface, but I agree with you. So the problem of user interface is, is very serious, but it's a problem on software in general. So, I mean, really, Microsoft Windows has had an horrible user interface and still was the market lead, okay? So it's not like the, the analogy between proprietary software, good user interface, and free software, bad user interface is correct. Sure, probably the, the most renowned software for good user interface has been made by Apple, which is mostly proprietary software, and I agree with that. But it's really that, in general, software do not always have a good history of user interfaces. But there is no reason why you cannot have sustainable business model of companies doing free software with good user interface. So free software really is about user freedoms. And there is nothing that says that it must have a bad user interface. So a couple of examples. So the GNOME people, which is one of the most popular uh, desktop environment you have on free software, are people, there are companies making money out of it, and they are investing money in user testing. So get, getting together users to do some user interface testing. Maybe it's not good enough at the uh, competition, but they, they see a business model in there, and they put money onto it. Another example is Ubuntu. So Ubuntu said, the company behind it decided that he wanted to, to, gra to grab the desktop market, the free software desktop market. They did it. Unfortunately, they've been, made, they've been uh, a bit unlucky with timing, I think, because the desktop market is kind of fading away. But they, said, they decided that with good user interfaces, they could seize the, the desktop market, and they, they did for the free software segment. So there are 
software and companies investing in good user interface for free software. So that's not really the, the one of the blocking factor. One of the blocking factor is apply the business model we know to work with free software and make them successful. One big question for the usability is also for whom was the software developed? And if you, like for example, look at the uh, GNU Linux operating system as a server uh, operating system, most admins will say that's very usable, that's very good. I like that system. It's, uh, at, at the time it was much uh, more usable than Windows NT. I like that and they still they continue to develop it in a way that it's usable for them. And they are contributing together. So the question is for whom is the other software developed? A lot of the software out there is developed for companies because they pay. I think one of the reasons why we don't have better software for individuals is because individuals don't pay for it. So we just get the software which was developed for companies and as a product, uh, the garbage product is then, let's try to also sell this uh, stuff to individuals. I think we would have much more better software for individuals if we are um, investing money in this, that it will be good for us because we will be the customers of this. If I could just point out to you one last thing. Um, uh, so I'm old enough to remember a world where people thought desktop computers ran Windows rather than Apple Mac OS X. Uh, and I remember people telling me how the user interface of that Apple software is terrible because they would come to it for the first time and it didn't work the way they expected. And I'd suggest to you that for a lot of software, bad user interface is simply a synonym for new and grossly inferior. Uh, and that is really the, what happens whenever there is change. The new is always inferior to the old, even if it's better. Okay, next question from Norway. Um, I heard uh, like we need to pay for good software. Uh, we have had thousands of examples where uh, companies have developed uh, yeah, testing software for designing new cars that has ended up with uh, becoming uh, uh, games. Uh, and uh, the more they are shared uh, for free on torrents, the more they actually sell of uh, the software they have developed for uh, commercial purposes, but then get an extra income uh, by actually uh, selling it as a game, packing it in as a game, right, for individuals. Uh, so, uh, I wouldn't agree 100% that we need to. <laughs> uh, what I mean is, uh, uh, when, when people share uh, the, this, this kind of, or this kind of culture, uh, the companies that have initially put them out in the market actually earns more money. Do you have any comments on that? I think we, we will all agree on this panel that we are not against companies making money with free software. That's not the, the battle we're, we're up against. The problem is that for me, as a citizen in a, in a globalized world, but of, of a citizen in general, I have a problem with companies when their gain is subtracted to the collective. So when they are able to lock something they gain out from everybody else. The nice thing about free software is that if a company is doing free software, is making money out of it, but the software itself is free, no one, not even the company developing it, can lock it up and remove it for be, from being a public good. So that's the key difference which I think makes us free software people not re having a real problem with companies making money out of free software, as long as the software itself is free. And beside that, what we also do in free software is we compete with each other. When someone buys software from a free software company, they are not locked down to this company. We, when, when you are not happy with, one of the co with, with the company you bought it from, you can go to any other company and ask them if they would also like to provide services for this uh, software. You can ask them to do, the, to do changes for, uh, for the software. With proprietary software, you can choose between uh, three companies 
and when you uh, decided to go to one company afterwards, you are in a monopoly with this software. You have to migrate completely to another solution again, but you cannot uh, ask someone else whom the first vendor did not agree on to give you a services for the software you are using now. So. And sorry, to, to add a, thing, a little thing on that. And with free software, you can always be a maker. So, okay, you, you pay the company to develop a specific feature for software. Okay, fine. You decided it was a good deal and you did it. But if one day you learn how to be a programmer or you have a good friend which can be a programmer and is happy to, to serve you on the basis of friendship, you can still do that. So you are not bound in any way to a company. You, are, you own your own software. And that's the, the, the point that I think makes software stand out with respect to physical devices, which can be uh, very much less accessible in some sense. One short comment. Uh, IBM has contributed to the Linux uh, environment, and they are earning money on uh, uh, consultancy uh, and using code that the Linux environment have developed. Uh, but they still have to give the code back to the Linux environment, right? That's part of the deal. So not all companies are after earning money on the code itself, but the, the work that is uh, done to specialize it for other companies. So this comes back to what I was saying about the industrial society. The industrial society had an economy that ran by monetizing scarcity. And there are software companies who live from the age of the computer before the internet, who believe that the only business model that can exist is to monetize scarcity. And now there isn't scarcity anymore. They try and artificially manufacture it by keeping the software proprietary or by hiding behind laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the USA to make digital restrictions uh, unbreakable. But there are plenty of businesses around who live in the 21st century and who aren't monetizing scarcity, but instead monetizing value. And those are the companies I suggest you pay. Uh, I, personally, I suggest you do not trade with companies that monetize scarcity, because now they have to manufacture scarcity, they manufacture it by, t by removing your freedom. Yeah, so what you're, you're touching is essentially the, the typical, one of the typical business model in, uh, in free software, which is the business model of services. I just want to comment on a, on a small detail which can make a big difference, though. The, way, the reason it works that way with the Linux kernel is that the Linux kernel is free software under a specific license, which is in the set of license we call copyleft. So it's a license which forces people to play by the rules. So if you contribute to that, well, if you can take the software, modify it, but if you're giving it to others, you are forced to also, also give back your changes to the, to the world, essentially. Um, there are different kinds of licenses in the free software world which have not this kind of pre property. There are the liberal licenses, and if you're contributing to, if you're giving, for instance, software, your source code to a company which is under a license which is not a copy of license, then you are back at the potential problem you are hinting at, so that Though your changes can be essentially locked and others can benefit from it without having the whole world benefit from it. So this is a topic which is still a little bit, I think, divisive in the, in the, in the software world. So there are people that think that copyleft licenses are better for this reason, others which think that liberal licenses are better for other reasons. And this is the kind of details you need to look into to actually figure out whether it's a good idea or not to give up some code to a specific company. And just a short addition, if uh, uh, Stefano was talking about liberal licenses, it means liberal, more liberal for the developer right. because uh, he doesn't have to um, think so much what he has to do, but not for the other people afterwards. So there's also different uh, difference between people who receive software and people who just who at the beginning develop the software in what's more liberal, what's giving more freedom to people. And actually, none of that matters very much in most big projects because you sign away your rights when you sign a, con a contributor agreement anyway. So uh, uh, the, one of the other things that makes the Linux project unique is it does not use a contributor agreement to override the terms of the copyright license. Um, so, but these days, I don't think it really matters whether you use a copyleft license or not very much 
uh, in a business context because businesses have worked out that they need to get all the rights from you before it gets under that license. But this is an advanced topic for the, for the panel that we do next year, the, 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 the 102 panel that we do next year. Okay, we have time for one last question. Hello, I'm Jim from Sweden. Um, I'm wondering how can f free software, as in um, the goal of having freedom and knowing what's happening to our data, how can that exist if we're not using free hardware, open hardware? So that's a very good point. So essentially, if you want to have real freedom, you need to be able to control all of the stack down to the electronics. But that's not even enough. And that's something that we, I often see overlooked in political debates about software. Even if someone is telling you, is, so this is the device and this is the software it is running, how can you be sure that the, the software which is actually running in the device is the same that you see as source code elsewhere? This is a debate which often came up, for instance, in debates about, uh, around uh, electronic votes. Okay, someone is telling, cool, we use an electronic voting system and it's all open source. Fair enough. How can I say that the ballot machine is using that version of the software? So it's actually about open hardware, but it's actually about even more than that. It's about being able to check independently that the software which is running on the machine is the same I'm telling you it is. So it's much more complex, and this is the kind of details we need to be very careful about when you do policy and law-making around technological stuff. Yeah. And in the final analysis, you're never going to work out whether that hardware is fighting against you. Um, they're, they're for, for all sorts of reasons. The previous panel we were on had uh, Jake Applebaum talking about uh, hardware that you purchase from online stores being relayed through a place where uh, the security services insert extra hardware for you. Uh, you've, you've no idea that that extra free modification has been done en route. Um, so I, I actually think that focusing on the details of open hardware and open source software don't buy us very much in a policy sense. We need to have a bigger vision. Uh, so what, what I would suggest is we need to have um, hardware which comes with uh, an enforced liability if it turns out to take away your privacy uh, so that there are consequences for taking away your freedoms. Uh, I think that if the Pirate Party wants to have a, a strong policy on this, it should be to default to liberty and make any um, deviation from liberty be a costly deviation. Because you can't ban things. If there's one thing that we should have learned from the war on drugs in America is that you can't ban anything. But you can regulate things and make the breach of the regulations expensive. And so I suggest that the best way to bring freedom practically as a political activity rather than as a discussion amongst geeks is to make sure that there is enforceable liability for people who take freedom away when they sell you something. Default to, free, to, default to liberty and charge people who remove it. Do that and you're much more likely to have free software running on free hardware because that will then be the cheapest way to comply with your liability requirements. Okay, so I think if uh, those are all questions, we can finish now. And I just would like to thank you very much for helping to remember us that apart from we are consumers, we are all also makers and creators. Thank you.